The following is my conversation with Johnny Teller. Johnny is one of Southern California's top trial attorneys in the personal injury space. He's also a great guy. Johnny talks about some of the evil narratives that the insurance companies push on the public and how false they are. He also talks about some tricks of the trade for people that may find themselves in a car accident and what value a lawyer really brings when corresponding with an insurance company. If you enjoy this clip, subscribe to my channel. This almost makes me want to get into the podcasting business because this is so official. Sounds like a looks hint cool. of sarcasm. No, for real. There was so, there were, you know, how COVID is, you talk about everything. So like, I probably had like 20 meetings about doing a podcast. And oh, wow. I'm just like, oh, dude, I'm so busy. I don't have time. <laughs> I would love to do it. Mm -hmm. But these guys that find time to do it, I mean, either. I'm not married. Right? Know, so that's, yeah. That's my, they aren't married, my... don't have kids. Right. And it's just like, I don't have time. I don't have time to do a whole bunch of things I would love to do. Mm -hmm. I'm too, busy well, I do. I'm too busy having fun with the stuff I am doing. That's great. Yeah. Once you get married and have kids, you'll see. Kids take up a lot of time. All the time, right? To like raise them, <laughs> clothe them. Buddy of mine, after he had his first kid, he calls me up. He sounded like, he sounded terrible. And he's like, <laughs> guess how many times babies eat a yeah, day? It's and like I'm just non -stop. like, oh, I, uh, I'm sorry. Eat and changing and they're always pissing all over themselves. And then you have multiple kids. That's when it gets real fun. Like one kid is like, all right, that's a lot. I have three kids. It's like. Different genders, different oh systems. Oh my goodness. Totally different systems <laughs> to learn about what girls like. I grew up with two brothers, so I don't know anything about girls. <laughs> oh, it's fun. Well, you met their mom, so I'm sure you're doing yeah. okay. Um, okay, let's go live. Let's do it. Let's do it. Thanks so much, All right. John. Nice to. Is see it John you. or Johnny? Uh, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Yeah. Okay. How you feeling? I'm feeling good. It's exciting to be here. Same. Really awesome. excited. In pop culture, the fast food of the legal industry is personal injury. Oh man. I know. And then I've been delving into it as I've been getting into it myself, and I'm realizing how deceptively complex this whole thing is. And how bad California is actually for the little guy. Um, but no, before we dive into that, maybe you can give a little bit of background as to who you are. And well, I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. Mm. So I'm Sorry born Canadian out mm -hmm. here. Yeah, I couldn't convince my uh, Angelina wife to move to the freezing cold north so easily. And you married into a smart one. Yeah, yeah. So came out west, took the bar exam. I went to law school in New York. So that was a very cool experience. Mm -hmm. I started on the defense side, actually, did five years for the defense. Very fortunate for that experience because, you know, I got to meet a lot of really respected attorneys and learning that whole practice and basically learning how litigation works. And then I was fortunate enough to get some calls from some friends uh, saying, hey, maybe you should consider now moving over to the plaintiff side. Mm -hmm. um, and... I did work on the defense side for a big firm that handled a lot of big cases. Um, and when I say big cases, I just mean like major injuries or death cases, which were like major valued cases in terms of the money. A lot of times they were sad cases. That's what goes along with big damage, usually big injuries. Sure. So, so, you know, I did some cases obviously with major brain injuries, major spine injuries, um, but also some like really sad child molestation cases also. Mm -hmm. And that was like, kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And it was just like, I couldn't do defense work anymore. It was just too sad representing the quote unquote bad guy or the insurance company telling these nice families that they don't deserve a lot of money anymore. So then I decided, yeah, I, I need to move to the plaintiff side. And I did, and it's been great ever since. It was, and I love it. I really love what I do. Yeah, you're crushing it. You're <laughs> thank absolutely you, thank crushing you. it. Something on your bio, it said that John's hardworking demeanor helped his clients obtain 20 of the top 50 personal injury settlements in California in 2020. That can't be true. Is, yeah. that, is that accurate? How do, how uh, do you even uh, know that? According, well, yeah, you know, I can't guarantee it's 100% accurate, uh -huh. but according to the, you know, verdict, um, search website they post uh oh cool so it was like an external party they came up with like but no really aren't settlements confidential like how would they or is the uh, verdicts not every settlement is confidential mm -hmm. um and even the ones that are confidential usually it's like don't disclose the name of the parties 
the facts of the case, maybe, you know, the courtroom even or the case number. But you can say just generally there was Mr. JD versus Mr. S M mm-hmm. and uh, the case resolved for, you know, two million dollars mm-hmm. because of X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. So uh yeah, so thank goodness, you know, that was I think two thousand twenty one. Mm-hmm. No, that was two thousand twenty. Yeah. Um, cause the 2021 report's going to come out soon. Hopefully we're at the top again, <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, it was a good year. Um, you know, we did really well for our clients and thank God, thank God. Yeah. So I really want to dive into those stories. You're a hundred million dollar man. You've produced over a hundred million dollars for your clients over the years. But before that, I, to illustrate what I was talking about before, that it's really, California's really not good for the little guy. So a family friend had got into a car accident and I was all jazzed up in the sense that I could be the one to handle it mm-hmm. and get this huge payday for this person. And then I delve into the situation and it turns out that in California, there's the minimum coverage that people must buy for car accidents is $15,000 per right, person correct. or $30,000 max per occurrence, which basically effectively meant that even though she sustained some serious injuries, thankfully nothing lasting, but she was messed up. She went to the hospital. The max she was able to get was $30,000. And that's before paying the doctors and the lawyers. So what is going on with these minimum coverages that the vast majority of people have how did that happen and what's your experience with that yeah so that's a great question and it's a really sad situation that happens in california because the insurance companies as you know control the you know whole tone and the message because they have billions and billions of dollars so they you know advertise to everybody you can have total full coverage maximum coverage and then when someone gets a car they call up an insurance company and they say, Hey, I need coverage. Oh, we'll get you total coverage. But then they only provide them a $15,000 insurance policy. And you know, your average person that doesn't know better thinks, okay, I got the insurance coverage that I was told that I need to get. And they only have $15,000 of coverage. And then a vehicle collision happens and someone is severely injured. And it's really unfortunate that Mm -hmm. you find out the person that caused the collision only has $15,000 of coverage and that's it. Um, is there any way around it? Like to get creative? I was trying to think for her, like there's gotta be maybe going after the person. I mean, these people are maybe insolvent, some of them. So there's not really the option of going past the insurance limit to the person that hit her. But I don't know if you, have you right? So anything like that? So, so there's two things. Number one is, yeah, you could always go after the person directly to ask them to contribute themselves. But like you said, most of the time, many people can't afford that, you know, they have their own bills and whatnot. And it's hard to uh, collect from someone that uh, doesn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So you have to always think about actually collecting the money at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is that uh, it's really important for people to have what's called UM or UIM insurance, which is another avenue that someone who's injured can collect from, which is their own insurance actually. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you get hit by someone, who has like $15,000 of insurance or no insurance whatsoever, um, you can actually call up your own insurance company and hopefully you've been paying part of your premiums, uh, this thing called uninsured motorist coverage. And then you can potentially collect from your own insurance. Um, Otherwise, it's just you got to hope that, you know, the general public slowly starts to realize that when you have total coverage that and it's only a fifteen thousand dollar policy that's really not great coverage and if you're someone that does make you know good money Mm -hmm. or you know can afford it you should get yourself an insurance policy that's you know a hundred thousand dollar insurance policy or a five hundred thousand dollar insurance policy or really even in today's world in a million dollar insurance policy god forbid you do cause a pretty significant wreck and cause someone serious injuries it doesn't cost that much. People don't realize it doesn't cost that much more to get an insurance policy within a million dollar insurance policy limit compared mm-hmm. to like two fifty mm-hmm. or even fifteen thousand. But the insurance companies they don't market that so much because they know it's not going to cost you so much more. But if you are in a collision, 
they potentially are going to be on the hook for more. Does that make sense? That does make sense. My question is though, why would I want as a consumer actually, why would I want to ever get more than $15,000? It's cheaper and you well, know, what to be a nice guy to put Geico on the hook. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Well, I mean, I have seen many cases where the actual individual does have to personally contribute. Mm-hmm. Again, there are people that once you start making money, like, you know, if you're making 30, 50, hundred thousand dollars a year. Now you have to start thinking about those things. If you own a home or if you own a car or if you own a business, I mean, you, if you only have $15,000 of insurance and you really, really hurt someone mm. and, you know, God forbid, kill someone in a car accident, let's say, yeah, then that person or their family can come after you and say, hey, okay, thank you for the $15,000 of insurance, but I see that you own a house that has value in it. Um, I'm going to put a lien on your house and I want you to pay up. I mean, so you have to be careful if you're only going to have $15,000 of insurance coverage, that is a huge gamble you're taking. If, if you knowingly have assets behind you or make a lot of money. Got it. So you think that, well, I guess before I ask how the insurance companies have dominated so well, I guess California just has the biggest economy, so they they need to protect themselves in, in that way. But when people see people, meaning me, these twenty eight million dollar verdicts that you've won, or three million, two million, whatever, what is happening? How is that? How is that sort of win happening in this climate? Well, I mean, you're you're not seeing you know ten twenty million dollar results unless there's obviously significant injuries involved, mm-hmm. um, and that and it's usually against like a company corporation that the case that you referred that I was involved in was a school district, um, so there's a lot on the line if you don't have proper coverage, right? Again, if a big business that's making millions of dollars a year only has $15,000 of coverage and someone from that company significantly injures someone and mm-hmm. ruins their life, um, and you know there's thousands upon thousands, if not millions of dollars of medical expenses, then yeah, the person can then turn to the business and say, hey, multi-million dollar business, you guys have to pay up. So that's why mm-hmm. these companies have insurance. Mm-hmm. How does Uber work? For like these Uber drivers, do they have their own policy? Uber's a very unique uh, company, and it's a unique beast as to how the litigation works. And mm-hmm. it's um, it's continuing to develop. You know, the law is usually a little bit somewhat outdated, and it slowly gets up to the times. And it's still everybody in California really is still figuring it all out. Quite honestly, I mean, we know about a lot of laws. Um, but there's different arguments on both sides, um, whether because the ultimate issue is I'm sure people know from um, a couple of years ago, the ballots and whatnot is whether the Uber driver himself is an independent contractor and completely independent from Uber. So and that applies to Lyft as well. That's another reason why they're fighting it so hard. Yeah, it's a huge debate. It's a huge debate how legally how it applies when you're talking about terms like vicarious liability and an agency. I mean, mm-hmm. this goes into like really deep legal theories. Um, but ultimately, if an Uber driver is like has a passenger and is working, for example, and then hits someone and causes a very big injury. Um, they typically have an Uber provides the driver $1 million of coverage. Mm-hmm. So again, $1 million is a lot of money. So usually, generally, that will cover someone. You know, if you have a very small injury that's only worth like $5,000, that you're fine. But when you're dealing with more significant injuries, when an Uber driver hits someone and that person's spine is deformed and needs surgery or God forbid a death or mm-hmm. brain injuries and whatnot, and they the value of the injuries are, are worth more than a million dollars, that's when it starts getting that those debates start happening is whether Uber's other insurance policies and the company itself is responsible um, for the damages caused. But right now the driver's out of the picture. No, the, the driver is always in the picture. The driver is on the hook, again, for the first million dollars for sure. Assuming that the driver is But through working Uber's for- coverage, not his own situation or her own situation. Well, I mean, that comes down to a 
depending on what the insurance policy says, but mm-hmm. I would say 99% of the time, mm-hmm. Uber's insurance company provides coverage and the individual who has his own policy um, usually defers to the Uber policy. Mm-hmm. But sometimes they kick in as well. So we got to dive into these um, <laughs> these war stories where you are obtaining deserving settlements for your clients. But before that, what are some other ways that California isn't really set up well for the little guy? Oh man, there's there's so many. It's really it's sad. It's you know the message that the insurance companies are always trying to. Um, put out there that Mm -hmm. you know there's greedy plaintiffs um classic term ambulance chasers not really a good term for uh plaintiff injury Mm -hmm. uh attorneys um and they're always trying to throw out that message that you know injuries are not really there or this individual who maybe suffered significant injuries doesn't deserve Mm -hmm. a lot of money their life wasn't really ruined um and they're good at throwing that message out and trying to convince the general public that really it's just, you know, the greedy injured person or it wasn't really injured or it's all the plaintiff's attorney's fault. Um, and, it, and it's sad. And uh, it's, you know, you learn about these, um, the propaganda that the insurance company has um, thrown out there that people really mm-hmm. believe in is when you're actually in trial um, and you're interviewing a jury, right? During the jury selection process before the trial actually gets on its way and talking to different jurors and hearing what they have to say. And mm-hmm. you'll have one person on this side of the room that like totally feels that way. It's like, oh, it's all greedy plaintiffs. He wasn't really that injured. You know, he doesn't deserve any money. And then you'll thankfully sometimes have someone mm-hmm. on the opposite side of the room with the complete opposite spectrum. Um, you know, sometimes if you don't have a family member or yourself that has been injured, um, you can't really relate. And I find that sometimes um, is the reason why people generally don't necessarily understand the value of, you know, life and mm-hmm. life experiences and why the value of these injuries is worth so much. So um, the insurance company does a great job in that regard. And then there's just a lot of laws out there that are very beneficial to the insurance companies that a lot of people don't know. Um, Again, your typical uh, insurance policy situation, the insurance company has, uh, there's a $250,000 insurance policy, let's say, and someone's significantly injured. The insurance company will hire the attorney for the defendant for the driver. So someone causes a collision, they call up their insurance company, they say, Hey, I just caused this injury. Um, help me, help me out. And that typical person thinks, Oh, my insurance is just handling it all for me. Little do they know that they're the actual person that's named in the lawsuit and the insurance company who hires the attorney. A lot of times it's really sad that the attorney, uh, hired by the insurance company is only communicating directly with the insurance company and not their actual client, not the actual person that caused the injury. And then cases just end Go up as they will drag out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the insurance company has billions and billions of dollars and they can hold on to their money. And, and what's really sad is sometimes the insurance company tries to suffocate not only the injured person financially, but also the plaintiff's firm, they try to suffocate them financially because a lot of- so? Make that concrete. So a lot of the majority of plaintiff firms are your average solo plaintiff attorney, right? He has to keep the lights on. He has to pay for you know the rent, his staff. So if an insurance company has the ability to drag out a case, for not only one year, but for almost five years, that plaintiff firm is typically not making any money at that time because most plaintiff attorneys work on a contingency fee. They only get paid when the case resolves. Mm -hmm. So the insurance companies know that they can do that, that they can drag out cases for a long time. Mm -hmm. Worse, the insurance company knows that they can make you spend a lot of money on a case. Um, lawsuits are not cheap anymore. They're expensive. 
Uh, there's court filing fees. There's what's called depositions to get the testimony of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's experts in lawsuits. Um, and experts typically are like doctors or um, engineers, um, biomechanics and accident reconstructionists to recreate vehicle collisions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the insurance companies, um, sadly, will fight on a case, hire a whole bunch of experts to support their position. And then the small plaintiff's firm doesn't have the money to compete with that. Sometimes these experts, you know, one expert can be $50,000, let alone if now there's five. I'm in the wrong line of work. Experts. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes there's experts can make a lot of money. You know, the, I've seen it again as a former defense attorney. And now I see it on the plaintiff side is insurance companies know how to strategically try mm -hmm. to outspend and financially choke not only the plaintiff who's been injured and maybe has been out of work and really needs the money mm -hmm. for both the medical expenses and their loss of earnings, but also the actual plaintiff's firm. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to dive into that you know, <laughs> battle of the experts. No, really, and other tactics that insurance companies have. A lot of questions around that, but something that came to mind is how does this compare to Canada? What's that climate like? I'm sure you saw wow. buddies over there, and like, what's the? How does it compare California to Canada? Oh man, that's a tough question. I wish I knew the answer. Mm -hmm. I quite honestly never practiced law in Canada. I only know a little bit from the people that I formerly, you know, grew up with and I'm still in touch with. My understanding is that in Canada, there's certain caps on damages with regard to what we call the non-economic damages, commonly known as pain and suffering. But it's not just pain and suffering in California you can ask for compensation for the physical pain, the mental suffering, the loss of enjoyment of life, fear, anxiety, inconvenience, mm -hmm. physical impairment, humiliation. Um, in Canada, from my understanding, is that you can't ask to be like compensated Canadians for don't all that. suffer yeah. those things. They <laughs> or there's just a cap. They say, all right, for this injury, it's like maybe a hundred thousand dollars or something. Regulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't okay, know. Okay. So then California is going to have to interview a Canadian lawyer <laughs> to get a precise answer. But my understanding is it from a major injury standpoint, like if someone, God forbid, is again, major spine injury, paraplegic, quadriplegic, and needs significant medical treatment and the medical treatment is going to cost a million dollars in Canada. Yes, you can have results that are in the millions of dollars based on the medical treatment. It's that other area category that they regulate, I think, a little bit more non-economic. Right. Yeah. So there's another concept of liens that I've been learning about that seems totally counter to what I would have expected, where these doctors are performing surgeries or injections without payment up front. And then they're saying, I'll put a lien on the settlement of the case. How does that work? Yeah, so um, it's actually that that's a great example of insurance companies trying to spin something to make it sound potentially negative. But it's actually if you really take a step back and look at it, it's actually a beautiful, positive thing. Um, and we deal with this in trial all the time, actually, um, when we talk about liens, if that is one of the things uh, in the case. So basically, there um, fortunately, there are great doctors out there that are willing to really help out people that are injured. Um, and if you're someone who is a healthy person, you don't have a great insurance policy, a health insurance policy. So like you don't have a PPO or you might not have health insurance at all because mm -hmm. you're young and you're healthy and you've never needed to see a doctor. Um, if you get severely injured and no fault of your own, you're just driving along and someone smashes into you, all of a sudden now you need medical treatment. Um, and it's not so easy to see good doctors if you don't have the health insurance that they accept or if you don't have significant money right even there's some doctors that say they only accept cash payment well if you don't have money to pay those doctors you can't see them so there are doctors out there that now have decided hey i'm going to take uh treat patients where the money part of it 
will be handled on a lean basis. So I will treat them, help them out, try to make them better if needed, if they need surgery, perform a surgery. And then at the end, when the case resolves, they say, okay, now you can pay me for all the work that I've done for the treatment that I've provided you. I think it's a beautiful concept. Is that- I think it's really nice that doctors have uh, provided that service to people that you know, have suffered. Mm-hmm. Is that on a contingency basis? Meaning if they don't win the case for whatever reason, then the doctor is like, all right, I don't need money at this point. It's I'll waive it. So typically um, there's an agreement that's made between the patient and the doctor's mm-hmm. office. Uh, from my experience, the doctors and the patient, um, the doctor will always want payment from the patient. The patient owes the money, essentially. They, the agreement is typically they'll get payment at the end of the case. So, you know, I've heard doctors say that, you know, they'll accept payment plans. They work with their patients. They're not trying to bankrupt their patients. Again, they're nice doctors that are really trying to help people out. So hopefully there's enough money from the resolution of the case from the insurance company to Mm -hmm. pay the doctors. If not, I've seen doctors say to their patients, hey, we can work out some type of payment plan for you to pay back. And I've also heard situations where doctors say, hey, you know, maybe the case went south, the defense and the insurance company were able to, you know, confuse the jury. It went to trial and it was a defense verdict, God forbid. Um, for that injured person, but they still owe their doctors money. Yeah, some doctors are kind enough to say, you know what, uh, I'm going to write it off. I, I can't wow. collect. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that happens. What about the these cases? So the majority of cases are where it's just a fifteen thousand dollar coverage situation, no matter what. That's what the person's going to get. So wouldn't it be fair to say that if someone has something that unfortunate happened to them then they have an mri they have fifteen thousand dollars in damages can't they just write a letter to geico and say hey i need the money like why would they need to call a personal injury attorney to do that that's a great question Mm -hmm. um yeah you're you can do that of course people do do that actually they don't hire an attorney and if they find out that there's only $15,000 of coverage and they want to try to deal with it themselves with the insurance company, by all means, go ahead and try to do that. Um, I think it's just another example of how insurance companies try to take advantage of the little guy. Usually when insurance companies see that there's no attorney and it's only an individual trying to like represent themselves, the insurance company will lowball that person and try to suggest to them um that oh no this is the true value of your case this is how much we always settle these cases for and try to offer something de minimis like a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars um and it works for them Mm -hmm. it it definitely works for them and the insurance company settles a lot of cases like that but um the i would say if you're smart it's always smart to consult with an attorney um and hear you know your options before you make a decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and typically I've seen those type of individuals that have tried to do it themselves. Again, we're lowballed and then up ultimately, you know, retain us and we're able to get them significantly more money. So I think um, a lot of uh, a big part of the industry is is respect within the industry. You know, insurance companies respect law firms um, and sometimes they'll offer more money because they know that will likely fight for our clients and obtain mm-hmm. more money ultimately. Mm-hmm. You seem like such a mellow guy. <laughs> like you just seem like such a mellow dude. Like how important is intonation and storytelling and drama in the courtroom when you're at these trials? It's everything. It's our, putting on a trial is putting on a movie. When I say a production, I mean, it's not only me talking. Me talking is half of it these days in the modern era where we live now people learn i think better sometimes visually than by listening that's why we're here there you go there are now uh animations animation companies that help us out and explain through visuals Mm -hmm. what the injuries are what happened to the person um you have animations from the actual let's say again, a typical vehicle collision, actually recreating the vehicle collision to show people what happened. Mm -hmm. 
to the actual surgeries, like what the actual surgery looks like that the doctor performed. And they get pretty graphic. Um, the animators are incredible as what they can create. Uh, and I think those are really, really important tools that any attorney has to have. And getting that visceral reaction, like watching a surgery or an accident, it's like, it's just this unmatched. As yeah, it, just it, talking about it, you it, know? it. Exactly. Exactly. But um, let's talk about your like favorite win. I mean, I don't know. <clears throat> it's always weird to say favorite win. These, these are such tragic. You meet people at the intersection of their lives that are just horrible. Um, but you did win a $28 million verdict. That seems really notable. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that story, set the stage and how that went. Sure. Sure. So, um, it was a case again, you're right. It's a very tragic case, very tragic case. Um, beautiful family incredible people a mother and her child um kid went to school every day um and the school district's policies uh with regard to how kids would get home from school just were not set up properly mm. um and ultimately a kid who should have been on the bus and, and was on the bus in his past um, was told that he had to walk home because he lived within a certain amount of miles from the mm -hmm. school. The family moved to within two miles of the school and the school had this policy that you can't take the bus anymore with whether you're in, within two miles of the school. And he had uh, IDC, um, sorry, an IEP. Um, and he was supposed to be on the bus. What is an IEP? An individual education plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to get so much into the intricacies <clears throat> of the details of the case, but ultimately, sad case, great kid, should have been on the bus, was walking home and um, stepped out from the curb and was hit by a car. And his life and his family's life changed forever. Mm -hmm. um, suffered a major brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's just a tragic, tragic, tragic event. And then ultimately the school district fought us, the insurance company and their attorneys fought us and they actually offered us zero, didn't offer a penny. They tried to claim that they were not responsible. Um, the case actually was, the term is bifurcated. It was the judge split up the case between liability, the issue of was the school district responsible or not, and the issue of damages, how much, what are the damages, what are the injuries and how much are they worth? So we actually had to get past the liability phase first mm -hmm. to even go and talk to a jury about the injuries and the damages. But it ultimately, thank God, worked out. Uh, we did the liability phase of the trial with a judge. It was a trial by judge. Mm -hmm. uh, the judge heard all the evidence. There was you know, 40 to 50 depositions that were taken prior to the trial of all the various people involved, all the various school district individuals and experts and whatnot. Um, and the judge heard the evidence, saw the evidence and ultimately decided that the school district was 100% at fault. Did they appeal it? They did not. They Why? did not. That seems. Um, well, so then ultimately we went to a mediation following that and we were able to settle the case for the 28 million mm -hmm. so we ultimately uh reached a resolution that everybody was happy with and uh agreed to and through that process we actually had an agreement with the school district that they changed some of their policies so that hopefully something like this never happens again wow um and is going to mediation in that situation i guess it's very personal so it would make a lot of sense if you don't want to get into this but is it motivated by just the family not wanting to deal with this? So they'd want to short circuit the situation as opposed to going to a jury and potentially getting more money. Does that make sense? There's a whole bunch of reasons why you would want to go to mediation. Mm -hmm. First of all, trying to resolve a case before a trial is definitely always a good idea for both sides. Right? Oh, why are you saying that? That's interesting. Because a resolution is a guaranteed result that everybody knows about and will accept. So uh, if you go to trial, right, at the end of the day, uh, if it's a trial by jury, you're asking 12 strangers who get a summons in the mail to mm -hmm. show up. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't necessarily know what those 12 strangers are going to decide. Whereas 
settling a case, going to mediation and settling it, mm-hmm. uh, is guaranteed. Have you, you hear had- the numbers and and you uh, know what you're going to get. Now, if the insurance company or the defendant comes and offers an amount that you don't think is, and your client doesn't think is the true value of the case, of course, then you can proceed on to trial and ask the jury or the judge what you believe is the true value of the case. But I think it's a good idea to always talk and say, hey, let's sit down and see if we can come to terms in a resolution. It doesn't oh, mean that's sure. always going to happen. For sure. I was just trying to tease that out of you. That, yeah, yeah. that makes total sense. That's very <laughs> intuitive. But are there times where the 12 strangers just like completely get it wrong? And if, yeah, what's that conversation like with your client? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that does happen. You know, it's sad when that happens. Mm. Um, Thankfully, I haven't had any really awful situations like that where, you know, it was clear liability and major damages and then it was a defense verdict. Mm -hmm. I haven't. Thank God. Oh, that's why you're in the top 20, (laughs) 50 personal injury. Yeah, but I've had verdicts that I haven't been happy with. You know, that does happen that, you know, you try to present the case to a jury Mm -hmm. and try to get the result that you believe represents the damages and what that person not only suffered in the past, but what is going to suffer in the future. And a jury either doesn't like your client or the defense attorney did a great job presenting the case. Something went wrong. You didn't present well. I mean, there's so many reasons why a jury can go against you. Sometimes it's a bad judge that influences the outcome in the case Mm -hmm. that happens sometimes Mm -hmm. unfortunately to people you know us attorneys all we can do is try our best try to tell our client's story through them uh, and their witnesses and their families and friends Mm -hmm. that hopefully will come up here and testify for them hopefully uh you get the great outcome but that's again it goes back to the experts sometimes these defense attorneys they hire so many of these experts and some of them there are experts at being experts I don't know, that sounds weird, but they've been in the industry for so long. These experts that are getting paid millions and millions of dollars by the insurance company. This is the most are, animated you've ever been. <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, have you had personal <laughs> stories where you've seen this or like? Yeah, it's really, it's really, really sad. It's mm-hmm. really sad that these defense experts are sometimes just so full of it. And they say the same thing on every single case. They can be convincing. They can. Experts at experts. Experts, experts are being, are being experts. experts. And that's why it's a sad world we live in sometimes when you see these people that should be good human beings and good doctors, and they literally are getting paid millions of dollars to ruin someone's life. Um, because if the jury, if you go to trial and the jury believes that defense expert over the, let's say the treating doctors or the plaintiff's expert or the plaintiff, it could be, uh, it can ruin a case. Wow. But you can't judge them too harshly though. You did it for five years, right? You were on that side. I did do it for five years and, um, th- there's no doubt there are righteous cases. I, I, there are righteous cases on the defense. There's no doubt about that. There are bad cases that unfortunately the plaintiff's firms do take that, you know, were not righteous. Um, there's no doubt about that classic concept of frivolous lawsuits, Mm -hmm. right? There are frivolous lawsuits, but there's also the other side of the coin. There's frivolous defenses to lawsuits. Sometimes also it's just a matter of, well, what are the value of the damages? Sometimes there's just a huge dispute as to how the injuries affect someone's life and whether it's worth millions and millions of dollars or whether it's worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And sometimes that's a reason to go to trial and there's Mm -hmm. a dispute there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> I want to take a quick break from the talk about all the personal injury stuff. There was something I saw on LinkedIn a while ago, actually, that you posted about going to the White House. That was kind of cool. Was there a personal injury convention at the White House at the time? Or like, how did that happen? What was that like? That was an incredible experience. Some people like to this day still make fun of me because uh, Donald Trump was the president at that time. And mm-hmm. I have friends on both sides of the aisle and I've got the extremes on both sides of the aisle and people, how would you go to the White House if Donald Trump is in the White House? I'm, first of all, I'm not a major political person to begin with, but if you're invited to the White House, I don't care if you 
despise the president, you go to the White House. Um, so it was a great experience. We got invited um, for the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. They have a Hanukkah party every year. Mm -hmm. And I really had nothing to do with it. I can't take any credit. <laughs> My wife got invited uh, through some connection she had oh, cool. um, through her work. Um, and I just got the plus one good old plus one. Um, but wow, what an experience seeing the White House and the various rooms and, you know, the Christmas trees and the menorahs up and and the people in oh that room goodness. are probably just like all the shakers. Uh, you know, <laughs> that is a hard no. That is the Hanukkah party was not in rock and roll. And it sounds like, no, yeah, no, yeah. I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. There was definitely a lot of, you know, people in Congress there. So that was cool to uh -huh. get to meet them and shake their hands and hear a little bit about what's going on. Um, you know, everybody had their reason why they were invited, I guess. I don't know. Uh, and then, you know, the president came out uh, and spoke a little bit. And that mm -hmm. was pretty cool. And they liked the menorah. There was a beautiful orchestra there. It was, wow. It was an experience. And it was a Hanukkah Christmas party. It so was a two birds, one stone situation. Yeah, I think it was specifically more, I think they have two parties. They might even have, the, who knows, they have like probably a party every day at the right. White House. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it was considered the Hanukkah party. Mostly Jewish people, I think. But mm -hmm. there was definitely a lot of people. Of all, all kinds. That's of cool. all kinds there. Yeah, it, it was amazing. So back to personal injury. <laughs> <laughs> enough of the white house enough about the white house um and unless unless donald did something that was uh wacky and notable then we can definitely no there, was, there wasn't wasn't any crazy stories like that it was just cool the security was that's they have good security at the white house mm -hmm. <laughs> for seeing it firsthand it's like wow mm -hmm. there's like 30 checkpoints you have to get through were there checkpoints into before the oh yeah like the well before like background checks on you or I, I think there was some type of, yeah, I, my wife sent in all the documents, so I don't know exactly, but I think so. And then there's checks that like before you get into the gates and then there's another mid check and then another check before you actually even get to the building. So oh, it, was, wow. it was very cool. That that just the perception of that makes you feel very secure. When yeah, you're yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, autonomous vehicles and just the fact that vehicles are getting safer and safer. I actually checked though, and it seems like accidents are more prevalent and more horrendous, which I don't understand that trajectory, how that's happening because cars are getting, like I was driving a Corolla at one point and it had like automatic braking, a Corolla. You nice. know? That's, that's pretty amazing. Cool. It's amazing. Yeah. Are you concerned at a certain on a certain level? I mean, everyone wants the roads to be safer, but eventually the thing that's been your bread and butter doesn't it look like that could be waning? Yeah, I know. It's unbelievable. Uh, mm -hmm. Elon Musk is shutting us down. <laughs> That's basically it. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? It's There's so much unknown uh, in that whole industry. You know, will there really be fully autonomous cars one day, let alone like people say in five years? I feel like they've been saying five years from now since like 2005. Right. So I don't think we're so close to fully autonomous vehicles where everybody has one of those types of vehicles in the super near future. Um, but yeah, you know, cars should be getting safer. And uh, obviously, vehicle collisions are probably the majority of injuries out there. And, uh, you know, if there's less injuries, there's less lawsuits, of course, um, which is a good but, thing, which is, yeah, which is, you know, people not being injured. That's the whole point of this whole autonomous vehicle push. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but who knows? You know, I'll go with Elon to Mars and I don't know if he's going to have autonomous vehicles on Mars so quickly. So who knows what's going to be up there? You'll set up a shingle up there. There you go. Safe. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe on the moon, you know, mm -hmm. who knows? But um, and then there's all those questions out there on, well, autonomous vehicles, are they really fully stopping all collisions? Right. Uh, you see if you Google it and read articles about, well, really, right now, this whole autonomous vehicle industry is basically using our roads and human beings as guinea pigs. And we don't really know whether the computer 100% is better off. And there are collisions that have happened. Sure. People have been severely injured. 
Um, and there's a lot of great attorneys and experts that are evaluating that whole industry because ultimately, yeah, maybe it's an autonomous vehicle that causes the collision. So then it becomes a product liability case. Mm. So who knows? There's a lot of unknowns in that industry. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. A lot of unknowns. Um, Hopefully they're going to make the world a safer place. I drove a Tesla. All right. So um, I'm not opposed to that at all. If it makes it safer, by all means, Mm -hmm. less injuries is better for the world, of course. Um, But it's who knows? So much time will tell. You mentioned product liability. Is that something you look for in a case where there's really terrible injuries? You're like, maybe the car didn't function in a way that made sense. And then you go after the car manufacturer on top of just the other driver and the injuries. Yeah, definitely. There are a lot of cases out there and for good reason Mm -hmm. that there are issues with the vehicles themselves. Um, Your typical, you know, seat back failure type of case. You know, a lot of people don't know about it until, again, they are in it or know someone that's been involved in it. The the seat just like moves in a way that it shouldn't have. Yeah, sometimes Mm. in a collision, like the seat back that you're on can completely break Mm. uh, or move in a way that is not proper or the seat belt itself or the airbag itself. You know, Mm -hmm. there are at the end of the day, these are products. The vehicle itself is a product and within the vehicle, all these things are various products. And those are things that have been evaluated, you know, businesses, the car manufacturing businesses, when they're putting out cars, these are things that they're even testing. So typically they know that these are issues and that's why, you know, when that happens, God forbid, Mm -hmm. uh, and there is significant injury, those cases do typically resolve because it's a known thing. Uh, It happens products do malfunction sometimes and that includes vehicles Mm -hmm. and the products within the vehicles Mm -hmm. do you have any other war stories or times with the jury that you either pulled a rabbit out of the hat or just something memorable where you were connecting with a jury or picking one or i find every time interacting with the jury is memorable Uh, i can remember every case and almost every single juror literally all 12 and sometimes it goes up to like 16 or 18 because you have alternates i even remember the alternates because i try my wow, best you're so in the zone what are you the michael jordan this stuff that's amazing <laughs> well you try your best you How know many jury trials you're... have you done um i think i'm up to i'm not at that many actually i'm probably only up to like eight in total because you're like settling them at right before a the lo- courthouse steps a lot of them either settle right before or even during jury selection mm-hmm um during jury selection they're like forget it we do not want this to be the is that that, that does happen wow. that actually does happen because a case can settle at any point right mm-hmm. a lot of cases you actually are mid-trial and then the parties sure. talk and just settle um there's even been situations that i'm sure you've heard where a case you do the whole trial and then while the jury's in the back deliberating figuring out what number the parties get together and they're like you know what we don't want to wait till the jury we're going to decide and and the case settles Mm -hmm. um but uh you know i've done a lot of arbitrations where it's just trial by judge i've done a lot of just trial by judges like the one we talked about earlier just uh two weeks ago i did a trial in federal court uh with a trial by judge Mm -hmm. um you prefer a jury though i imagine uh, every case is different. Uh, there's pros and cons, pros and cons, depending on the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, generally, I would say, you know, my first instinct is, hey, let's get a jury. Um, but every now and then, you know, depending on the facts of the case and the issues, uh, you might want to judge when it's a very legal issue or a complex issue mm-hmm. that, you know, your average person off the street might not fully appreciate. Um, so you might want to judge in those situations. Um, but yeah, what I try to do, going back to your question about, you know, why I remember the jurors and whatnot, every time you get to talk to the juries, jury, you really want to try to connect with each individual juror because hopefully in the back, when they're deciding the case, each juror will have an opportunity to talk and give their uh, impressions and thoughts. And you want to really connect or try to connect with each individual person to hopefully get them on your side. And in California, you need nine out of 12 jurors on each of the questions on the verdict form. Uh, In federal court, you need a unanimous verdict, all 12. When you're doing jury selection, when you're doing opening statements, Mm -hmm. when you're doing closing arguments, Mm -hmm. you really wanna try to take your time and look at each juror 
uh, in the face and at some point really just talk to them and connect to them mm-hmm. and then move on to the next juror. Um, I think I, I've been taught from you know the best of the best attorneys. I always listen to all the best out there. And I think that's the general agreement is try to really connect with each person individually. Like telepathically, like looking at them. Yeah, look, look in their eyes and tell them the truth and say, Are you researching them on social media and saying like, oh, this guy likes this and that, and I'm going to try and angle it in a way that makes that happen? Or You know, a lot of attorneys do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish I would have the time to do that sometimes. Quite honestly, I just don't have the time. I don't have the resources to do that. Mm-hmm. Um Sometimes Facebook and Instagram doesn't really tell you that much about a person, um, but sometimes it definitely does. Like you know, there are people out there <laughs> put their whole lives and then some on Facebook. Sure. So yeah, you can learn a lot about them. So you know, during jury selection, sometimes we do that, mm-hmm. um, but sometimes it's just really hard, especially when you have a judge. Again, like I said earlier, sometimes judges influence things that happen. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes judges like don't give you a lot of time. They're like you're only going to get 20 minutes to question this whole panel of, you know, 25 jurors mm. go. And then they cut you off. The so, voice you did was very stuffy. Not only it, it was the did, 20 minute did, like stuffy. <laughs> did, did I sound like a judge? That's, yes. You sound like ever a very I'm a judge that I'm going to change my voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. This was amazing. I learned a ton. I still have a one or two more questions, but this was really, this was really good. Um, mm. How are you doing? You're good. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, it's, I hope I said, I don't know, who knows? Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. No, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, Do you ever get imposter syndrome? Like, or maybe earlier in your career when you were on the defense side, that would be good. You're just like, don't really know what you're doing. <laughs> I'm a huge advocate of research. A lot of attorneys don't do research. First mm-hmm. of all, just the jury instructions. Um, it's shocking how many personal injury attorneys on both sides, whether you're on the plaintiff side or the defense side, don't actually know the questions that the jury is actually going to have to answer at the end of the day, meaning the verdict form. And they don't know the laws that apply to the case, which is the jury instructions. So I'm a huge advocate whenever I talk to people uh, about a case, because sometimes people call me and say, hey, you know, can you review this case? What are your thoughts? Um, which is Another beautiful thing about the plaintiff side in general, a lot very of times, very collaborative mm-hmm. attorneys, you know, call me all the time and I'm always willing to talk to the shop and vice versa. If I have some funky issue or I just want to hear someone else's thoughts, you know, two heads are always better than one. So why not pick up the phone and hear someone else's thoughts? Sure. So uh, I always tell a person, well, you know, did you review the jury instructions, the law that you're going to have to follow? You know, a lot of people don't. Uh, those that do okay but now when you have that's like, crazy it is crazy <laughs> that it, is it is beyond horrible crazy. but not only that is doing the research i mean the laws in california are based on primarily uh the statutes which you should read but then also the case law like the court of appeals and the supreme court of california how they've interpreted the laws and how they decide on certain things there's so much knowledge to learn just reading prior cases. Totally. You know, 99% of the time, guess what? You're not the first person that has experienced this type of situation in this sure. case. There probably was one before you. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can learn how the courts have come down on these I- issues, uh, particularly the legal issues. Um, and I, so I'm a huge advocate of doing research. You know, Westlaw is a, a great tool there's something called lexus nexus great tool and then learning it from there and seeing if your case fits that mm-hmm. or is there something that's unique about your case that you can distinguish it so i'm a huge yeah that's what i was research. touching on before like how deceptively complex this area of law is there really is a lot to dig into with it it's yeah, not just so cut and dry it's true it's true there's real complex law mm-hmm. and then not only research not only the jury instructions and the research but again like i said there are probably attorneys out there that have done it before you and probably do it a lot better than mm-hmm. you i mean there are some fantastic attorneys out there sure. in california And what's beautiful, again, being on the plaintiff side is that everybody's typically willing to share. Don't be afraid to call people up. Um, You know, all the great ones out there, you know, Brian Panish, Gary Dordick, Arash Hamampur, you know, the list goes on, really. They are 
the nicest human beings. And if you, if they've done some funky case with a great result, call them up, read their transcripts. I'm a huge fan of reading past trial transcripts. I love to read that stuff. Wow. Look how other people do jury selection. Look how, read how other people do opening statements and a cross examination, a closing arguments. There's probably things that you haven't thought of how to cross-examine, you know, the defense hired gun doctor. I probably have learned more through reading other attorneys' mm -hmm. transcripts um, than anything I've ever done. Wow. Um, do you have any thing that you do the morning of trial, like a morning routine? I play Rocky or something? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big superstition guy. Mm -hmm. um, there's no unique pair of socks or some old pair of underwear that I wear. I, I don't like... You know, Do you have a morning routine in general. Um, I so again, learning from the greatest people out there. Um, I have learned that you know the wealthiest and smartest people in the world wake up really, really early. So I've trained my body to try to do that. My alarm typically goes off around four thirty, um, sometimes four forty-five in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, Slacker. Try to wake up early <laughs> and get a good start on the day. So I usually have some alone time, eat my breakfast. I have three kids. So once they wake up, you know, it's a different day. It's a different day and you got to get to work. Mm. Kids are uh, amazing, but, you know, you got to raise them. Mm. So uh, try to, you know, sometimes I even get some work done. I read a lot. Um, sometimes I work out in the morning, but it, I think it's important to start off your day. Greet the day with early. productivity at 430. That's yeah. Like impressive. why, why sleep in so late? Like, what are you doing? Like, do you really need the 10 hours of sleep? You know, mm -hmm. I think five, six hours of sleep is, is not too bad. So that's where I'm at. Um, and then, so that's my typical norm, you know, routine is I wake up early, alone time, have mm. my coffee and a Quest bar. Big fan of Quest bars, by the way. Don't know if we're allowed to say Quest bars. I think we, <laughs> I think we can, but those things like, those are one of those things with like the ingredients that they have like Xanth, like 10 different variations of Xanthan gum. Like what, what is in this thing? I don't oh, know. I have no idea, but they have protein and fiber and they're and delicious works. and there's so many different flavors. I can have a, we can do a whole po podcast on Quest bars. We, they should oh, sponsor man. this episode. Yeah, this seriously. Is, Brought to you by Quest. Um, but it's such a good name also Quest. Seriously. Yeah. yeah so, uh, uh, yeah, I have Quest Bar. Like I said, I read, sometimes work out. I got mm. Peloton. Throw Peloton in the advertisement too. Yeah. Great. Tons tool. of corporate sponsor well, I, I was on the Peloton this morning at like five in the morning. It was That's amazing. why you win your trials. Peloton. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Quest so, and Peloton. Step yeah, it up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, I, my kids get up. I get them dressed, mm -hmm. brush their teeth, feed them breakfast. And then I drive them to school. And then from there I go to the office. And, Amazing. Yeah. This is really great. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. We're going to, we're called, we'll call Quest. We'll get, we'll get you a lifetime supply. Oh man. That would literally <laughs> make my day. If you spoke to people in my office, I eat Quest bars like throughout the day. It's, oh it's kind of weird. Actually. I had a professor that did Cliff bars. People that if anything, that's the one thing people get upset about me at during trial is, you know, at lunch, like break, they, they want to go get like lunch at lunch. And I'm just like, nah, let's get a Starbucks coffee and a quest bar. That's like, that's like my go-to mm. meal. <laughs> People are always so upset. What do you mean when you get something else? No, <laughs> quest is the way to go. Quest, quest okay. trust me. So amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Learned a ton. This was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. For sure.